So we've been a bit spoiled the past couple of weeks with some good matchups, and this weekend that hot streak came to an end. The David Benavidez David Lemieux bout was the fight I was least looking forward to, as it was the most the outcome was the most predictable. Um, this had early round stoppage written all over it from the moment it was added to the calendar. Uh, David Lemieux has been damaged goods ever since 2011 when he lost to uh, Marco Antonio Rubio and his career never really quite recovered from that loss and that was 11 years ago and so now lately he's had some uh, long stretches of inactivity only having three fights in the past four years and he came into this fight and looking uh, thicker around the waist so all signs pointed to an early knockout win I thought he could have. I thought the fight could have been stopped in the first round, um, but you know Benavides he flashed his hand speed and he looks the goods. Um, but he has to get a high-profile fight. Uh, I don't think he's going to go straight in against a Canelo or even Bivol. So uh, I, I'd rather see him make his bones against a Caleb Plant or a Jamal Charlo first. So this week's From the Archive is a look back at David Gonzalez. Uh, I got to meet Gonzalez back in, um, this was around 1988, uh, when I traveled with my trainer, Jimmy Simmons, and uh, Eric the Prince Martin. Uh, we went to San Jose's Alum Rock Gym, where uh, Martin would spar with Gonzalez as they were both getting ready for fights. So I think uh, my trainer wanted me to get used to uh, an experience traveling to different gyms and uh, giving, getting different sparring. Um, so when I met Gonzalez, he was gracious and polite. Uh, he had he had kind of that uh, Oscar De La Hoya presence about him. Uh, you can tell he was going places. Uh, he had charisma, and he had the, the bearing of a winner. And um, around this time, there was a writer named Jack Fisk who had a uh, boxing column in the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper, and he would write glowingly about Gonzalez's prospects. Uh, number one, because he was the, uh, one of the few... Uh, uh, contenders here in the Bay Area at the time period and uh, but he also he looked to be a real up-and-comer in the lightweight division and from what I saw in the gym uh, he could have won a title as a 135 pounder um, uh, he and Martin they, they sparred five five-minute rounds uh, with a uh, and he had Gonzalez had Martin pinned to the ropes the whole time pretty much and uh, Eric the Prince Martin he was a really crafty and cagey veteran so that, that speaks a lot about his, his talent. Uh, Gonzalez's pro career started off good, as I said, but uh, I think he got into some legal trouble around 1990. I don't recall what happened, and he took a year off, which uh, halted his momentum, and he came back as a welterweight. And when he came back as a welterweight, he wasn't as effective. Uh, he would eventually get a title shot in 1995 against Terry Norris for the junior middleweight crown, uh, but again, he was uh, past his peak from the late 1980s and fighting way above his uh, optimal weight class. Uh, Gonzalez's biggest wins were against uh, Skipper Kelp, who was an amateur star who was undefeated before he met Gonzalez, and uh, Anthony Baby Jones, who fought out of the cronk and once stopped Edwin Rosario. Now, what is unusual about Gonzalez is that two of his opponents were fatally injured during their bouts with him. Uh, there was Rico Velasquez in 1988, and then six years later, uh, Robert Wangia would die of injuries in their fight. So here is David Gonzalez taking on Lewis Howard, a former amateur star out of St. Louis. Up to the body. I mean, he has been working hard. Good, good shots by Howard. Most caught on the glove, but looks impressive. He's slipping an occasional right uppercut in there to the chin. In round two, David Gonzalez received a cut to the inside of his mouth, was bleeding profusely at the time. His corner doing a good job. Interesting rounds to watch as both fighters showing a lot of determination. Final seconds of round five, we'll take a break. Come back with round six of this championship matchup. Punches. I've got this a pretty close fight, 48 to 47. One point in Gonzalez's favor. Gonzalez tired in that last round, didn't look as effective, and Howard came back with some very strong shots, such as that uppercut you see right there, to build points for himself. In holding his own, though, he's done some good work on the inside, appears to be an excellent counterpuncher, but the smothering shots and tactics of David Gonzalez have rendered Howard unable to really unload with the right hand, and that's his 
most promising and potent weapon. He's scored nine consecutive knockouts. He obviously has power, but Cal Gonzalez keeps him bottled up as he goes to the body. Keeps him smothered, completely smothered, so he doesn't have punching room. And of course, that's what that uppercut would do. Give him the punch. Now punch. What we mentioned at the top of the show is not happening because of the expertise on the part of Gonzalez. Look at that exchange between these two guys. Gonzalez opening up now. He's getting the better. Lewis Howard unable to use his legs to escape the steady pulverizing attack. David Gonzalez appears at Howard with his feet. He has his moments when Gonzalez quits fighting and stands in corner. I'm sure his corner is just raising off that game. Here he comes again. Gonzalez just missed with a right hand that might have ended it right there, or at least put Howard in significant trouble. And the left scores now to the head as Gonzalez takes his attack upstairs. All of his other fights have ended early, especially so in his last nine on his phenomenal knockout streak. He hasn't got more than five any time in the last couple of years. Howard finally starting to show some wear on his legs when those punches come into his, to his midsection. He's controlled the action since round four of this fight and pretty scorecard reflecting the same. Not much that uh, the corner of Howard told him, uh, except that you go to the body also. Not possibly a very good uh, measure when he, Howard has been getting cream to the body, and I don't think he can outspeed Gonzalez to the body. This is Howard's best action of the fight since the latter stages of round two. As he fires away, Gonzalez doing a good job of blocking a lot of these shots. This is with a wild left hand and gets tagged with a left from Howard. Comes forward, very reminiscent of Julio Cesar Chavez. Lets his fighter get off, comes back with something stronger. That's the only sign I've seen of weakness of Gonzalez that every once in a while he stops and lets the other guy tee off and for no reason. Not that great a defensive fighter. So uh, lets the other guy get brave and the judges start making on their mind that Howard's coming back. But then again, here he is. Head to chest, hooks to the body, and hooks to the head. Ooh, good left hand work by Dave Gonzalez as he connected first with a short left hook and then an uppercut. Howard back into the corner. The action has been similar in all 11 rounds. Hammering shot. We'll keep it here between rounds. And we go to the 12th and final round, which it appears we will, as we have 20 seconds to go in number 11. Two. Gonzalez has just worked very, very hard. And again, Gonzalez chooses to go to the corner and let uh, Howard, who has to feel desperation after what his corner has told him. And Dave Gonzalez goes down. What a surprise, Bernie, just what you were talking about. Down in a heap. Are you all right? Takes an eight count. We'll see if he can survive the round now. He's got a long way to go. He was taking that for not for no reason at all. He looks wobbly as Howard comes forward. He motions Howard to come in and he goes down again just from exhaustion. Yep. Second knockdown. The three knockdown rule is in effect, and we have a lot of time remaining. He, he takes that without a punch. He's just taking it to clear his head, but boy, that's dangerous. That is dangerous. One more knockdown, and this fight belongs to Lewis Howard. He senses something as Dave Gonzalez will try and survive the final minute 55 of this fight. That's a long way when you got a killer puncher like Howard on your back. What a turnaround in the final round for the NABF Welterweight Championship. Lewis Howard appeared to be hopelessly out of this one on the scorecards. And Dave Gonzalez went down. Gonzalez has got a punch on him. He can't just hope to hold him. He looks exhausted. He winks over at Esperity as if to say he's okay and he's going to make it. He ain't okay. He's a long way from okay. He's got to do some fighting. He can't stay there. That's when he's going to get hit. He cannot stay at long range. His legs do not look solid underneath Dave Gonzalez. Well, get hit. he's got to hold on. He's got to hold on. The crowd certainly getting its money's worth with this one. Boy, if you're talking about a cliffhanger, Howard's got him just out. He just finished. Left hand scores from Lewis Howard. And on the scorecards, he may have a 10-7 round here with the two knockdowns. It wouldn't make any difference. He's too far behind. 
Gonzalez now trying to regain his composure. 52 seconds. If he can just make it for 52 seconds. Oh, he's fading. He looks bad. He looks very bad. His legs are gone. If he can just cool up, hold him. If he can just hold him, but he can. Championship caliber stuff in round 12. The NABF walked away title at stake. A possible world title shot. 30 seconds inside of that big. Gonzalez has to hang on, Freddie. 23, and boy, does that decision loom big now. Because this could be almost over. And he regains his feet. 14 to go now. 12. I tell you, this is a clip to hand. Now, Gonzalez senses he's got it. Gonzalez senses he can make it to the bell. And he made it. He does. What a fight. What a fight, what a finish. Can you believe that, Howard? Can you believe the guts to, of Gonzalez to wither that storm? With over two minutes to go in the round, he was out. And yet, here he is at the mercy of the judges, and is this going to be interesting? Woo. Judge Wilson Robinson scores it 115-111 to the NABF welterweight champion, David Gonzalez! Gonzalez! A thank you to uh, those of you who checked out the uh, Matthew Saad Muhammad and uh, Vince Foster videos. My additional thoughts on Saad is that uh, I think he lost uh, some of his desire after he discovered his true identity. Uh, you know, in his Bouts uh, previous to that, uh, he seemed almost superhuman with the amount of punishment he could absorb. And I think he was able to do that, you know, only because of what happened to him in his, in his early life. You know, he wanted to become, um, he wanted to be somebody after being left in the streets, just like a, you know, a piece of garbage. And uh, this motivated him to be, uh, become a boxing's version of a superhero, basically. You know, he was the guy that always came back and saved the day. So once he found out who he was and he realized that there was not never a family out there that really cared about him, uh, my observation is that he had given up a little bit. He had to have given up a little bit mentally, and he lost that edge. And, of course, you know, there was the, the wear and tear from those uh, unbelievable battles against uh, Marvin Johnson and Yaki Lopez and, and on the rest. They, uh, it took its toll. But, again, uh, Matthew Saad Muhammad had an incredible run in the light heavyweight division and uh we never saw the likes of him uh, before or since. Now, as far as Vince Foster goes, uh, it appears that name is cursed as he shares the name with the Clinton lawyer, who uh, still remains a uh, popular conspiracy theory because of his alleged suicide. Uh, boxing's Vince Foster was a guy who was wired differently. Uh, in doing research on him, I came away thinking that what was reported on him was only the tip of the iceberg. You know, he was charged with rape, as I, I stated in the video. And I was surprised to read that his, his own manager, Jack Hurley, incriminated himself by admitting that they got uh, Foster off by, quote, devious means. Uh, so we could surmise that they paid the girl off or threatened her or both uh, because Foster was headed for some big paydays. You know, 30K to 100K fights were a lot of money back in the late 1940s. And uh, also, uh, Foster's wife was actually sued after his death as there were surviving occupants in the vehicle that he crashed, and they went after his estate. Uh, the wife would eventually settle out of court. So Foster wasn't exactly a model citizen. He was a born-again, he claimed to be a born-again Christian, but then he's accused of rape and dies in a car with his mistress, and he left his wife with the bill. So two questions for the mailbag this week. Uh, this one's from Alfredo Sierra. Uh, when did the pound-for-pound -pound category begin, and by whom? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the earliest occurrence I've seen of the phrase was by uh, Benny Leonard and when he described Joe Gans. Uh, but the phrase doesn't become popularized until years later when a Canadian sports writer named Dink Carroll used the description pound for pound best in describing Sugar Ray Robinson back in 1951. Now guys like you know Harry Greb, uh, Sam Langford, and Henry Armstrong, to name a few uh, legends from the previous eras, they were always described as the best fighters in boxing uh, during their time, but the phrase pound for pound wasn't used on a regular basis until after uh, Dink Carroll began using it in his columns. Uh, I could be wrong if someone wants to uh, correct me with the uh, proper evidence, uh, feel free. 
but it appears for me now that the uh, phrase was first used by Benny Leonard, but officially coined by Dink Carroll. Next question from uh, Rauno Loik. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, I would love to hear your take on Hopkins's IBF title reign at 160, especially leading up to the unification tournament. Yeah, I think Hopkins's title reign ranks favorably with uh, anyone in middleweight history because of the longevity. And uh, he did take out some legitimate tough guys. Uh, he beat an undefeated Glenn Johnson. Uh, there was Antoine Eccles, Robert Allen. Those were solid guys. Uh, Eccles and Allen in particular didn't get a whole lot of press. Eccles was a really good puncher. Uh, he was wild, but he was strong. And uh, Allen was a slick southpaw who was uh, giving Hopkins all he could handle in their first fight until Hopkins fell out of the ring and then they couldn't decide whether he injured his knee or sprained his ankle. They just stopped the fight and uh, declared it a no contest. So, yeah, um, my my feelings are Hopkins are mixed. Um, he's among the best technicians of his time. He's a great strategist, uh, incredible longevity. But he did participate in some stinkers. And in some fights, he was overly tentative and uh, did some bluffing uh, when it benefited him, uh, particularly in the uh, Allen fight. So that's it for this episode. I'm uh, really looking forward to next week's fight with our uh, Javante Davis and uh, Rolando Romero. Uh, Romero punches pretty hard, and he has an awkward style. So uh, considering his size, uh, I, I see a good clash of styles and personalities here. So yeah, let me know what you think on that one, and uh, if you have any questions for the mailbag. And I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.